Welcome, everybody. So glad to be here with all of you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. It's going to be a fun conversation here tonight. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell, invite your friends and family. It's going to be fun. Let's do it. American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything will be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the masses. We need a government of action. All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to be here. It's going to be a fun evening. Yet another one of our great conversations. Um, so, yeah, you know, a few few opening things to go over, a few comments, um, you know, a few comments to go over, a few opening remarks. Those of you who may not be familiar with the way we do things here, um, Usually what happens here is I give my opening remarks. Uh, my opening remarks are given as I'm writing down your Super Chat questions. And then from there, after I give my opening remarks, after that, we do the roll call. And when the roll call is done, uh, I call you all out. As I see you, names and locations, we find out who's on the other side of the camera. And that is always, always lots of fun. And then after that, uh, I just answer your super chat questions for the rest of the night. So that's the way we do things. It's three parts, really only two, with a little fun intermission where we get to know our audience. But that's the way we do things here on this show. Uh, it's the opening remarks with me writing down super chat questions, me giving a roll call where we call out who's watching names and locations. We find out who it is on the other side of the camera. And then from there, we answer super chat questions for the rest of the night. It's a lot of fun. It's really, really a lot of fun. So a couple quick business announcements. There are two important dates coming up and both of them are important dates in our nation's capital. Washington, D.C. Uh, the first one is on February 19th. There is going to be a very important anti-war demonstration called Rage Against the War Machine. The Center for Political Innovation is an official sponsor of that demonstration. And that night, afterwards, we will be hosting a reception. Uh, there will be a number of guests that are there. There will be music. There will be food. There will be speeches. Uh, we're going to be having a reception, an after party if you will, after the great important anti-war march set for February 19th. So if you are planning to planning to be in Washington, D.C. for that anti-war march, be sure to come to our reception. If you want to protest against the war, by all means, come to that important anti-war demonstration. It's going to be awesome. And if you're in town, come to our reception afterwards. It's going to be important. we got a team of folks who are going to be participating in that demonstration, and we're going to have a great event afterwards. We'd love to have you there. So that's one date, February 19th. The next date that is of great importance is March 25th and 26th. That's two days, the 25th and the 26th. Those are two days. Um, and there's going to be an important conference also in Washington, D.C., hosted by the Center for Political Innovation. Uh, details about that will come soon. Uh, we cannot comment on it yet. We are waiting to make the formal announcement as we get things together. Um, so that those are the two important dates uh, that I wanted everyone to know about. Um, and, uh, you know, just keep those in mind. If you would like to participate, 
in the activities and the planning of these events, if you'd like to be part of our organization that is providing socialist education and and doing anti-imperialist work in these times, uh, if you would like to um, if you'd like to participate, we'd love to have you as a member of the Center for Political Innovation. So you can sign up on the website. Um, we'd really love to have you as a member. The other quick announcement uh, is that if you support the work uh, that this YouTube channel is doing, uh, we would love to have you as a member of the Patreon. Uh, members of the Patreon page, uh, they get uh, they get books uh, provided to them whenever I publish a new book. Uh, they get one sent to them. Uh, and also, members of the Patreon, uh, they get to be part of intimate, small, patrons-only streams. Those are a lot of fun. So if you want to be part of that, by all means, sign up. Uh, we would love to have you. Um, it's going to be awesome. So those are the opening announcements I wanted to make. Um, be sure to remember February 19th. Be sure to remember March 25th and 26th. Uh, be sure to sign up and join the Center for Political Innovation. Be sure to, to uh, become a member of the Patreon. That's what we've got going on. So a couple things. I guess I'll just get into my opening remarks for tonight. A couple things. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was just something I wanted to highlight. I just thought it was worth um, worth making people aware of is that AOC, our esteemed congresswoman from New York City, uh, she was having a press conference the other day, a couple days ago, and uh People that don't want a new world war, people that are opposed to the idea of World War III with Russia, made a point of kind of disrupting it. Um, and this is how they did it. Um, it's kind of interesting. They were, they sang, uh, you know, uh, they sang an old, uh, old Latin hymn calling for peace on earth as they held signs as she was to start speaking. It was kind of a poetic beautiful moment. So I just thought I would show that. I think people should see that this happened. Sending weapons to Ukraine. Um, and so, you know, it is it is a welcome and actually a 
active part of our civic life. So um, thank you all so much. And I'm happy to speak to uh, some of those points that were raised there uh, towards the end when we get to our Q&A. Um, but thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Everybody for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, and so once again, um, this is our first. Uh so yeah, that was uh, how they chose to intervene at AOC's uh, town hall event. So that was uh, that was particularly good. I thought it was a particularly good way of intervening. I know that there was uh, some other interventions. There were people who got up and called out the Democratic Party. Um, there were different uh, different interventions. Um, but uh, that was that was a particularly effective intervention because we must do all we can to stop World War Three. The danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared but revolution is the main trend in the world today. And um, that's a theme. You know, we end all of our live streams like that. How do I end every stream that I do? I say a new upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. And uh, that's how I begin my live streams, because those words were written, I believe, in 1972, one of the final statements of Mao Zedong about defeating U.S. imperialism and its running dogs. But those words remain very, very true today. And the danger of a new world war is more acute than ever. But the main trend in the world today is not the threat of nuclear destruction. The main trend in the world today is the upsurge of humanity. The people of Africa, of Asia, of Latin America, crawling their way to the light, gaining access to running water and electricity, literacy, education. All across the planet, we're seeing an upsurge in humanity. And China has been rapidly transformed and Russia has been rapidly transformed and country after country is breaking out of this global financial system, this rules-based global order, this open international system, this cabal of global usury that has been set up, the rule of the world by the big banks and corporations, imperialism capitalism in its monopoly stage, imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, people all crawl across the planet are breaking out of that system. And I do these streams night after night after night, and I organize the Center for Political Innovation. We put on events and conferences. We publish books because we know that it is only a matter of time before our country, the United States of America, the homeland of imperialism, the heart of the beast, the center of the empire, is only a matter of time before our country also joins the global axis of resistance and breaks out of imperialism and begins moving toward a socialist society, one where the banks and the factories and the industries and the centers of economic power are organized to serve public good and the people and not the profits of a wealthy few. And that we, as people living in this place, in this time, have a specific, very important responsibility. It is not our duty to pander. It is not our duty to engage in identity politics, cancel culture, wokeness. It is not our duty. 
It is not our duty to sit on the internet, compare revolutionary theories from the past. No, our duty is to build a revolutionary movement here in America. Our duty is to go lower and deeper to the real masses, to get out of the movement and to the masses. It is our duty to get the American people to understand that instead of having a destructive, imperialist, dying society around us, we could, in fact, have a government of action that fights for working families. We could have a government that took control of our natural resources and used the natural wealth of this country to raise the people up from poverty. We could have a government that launched a mass program of reconstruction, built new highways and bridges and high-speed railway and power plants all across this country, pushed forth fusion energy. We could have a government that took control of the banking system and canceled the debts and started organizing credit and the lending of money in a way that could secure the explosion of economic growth that is desperately needed all across this country. We could have a government that enacted Roosevelt's proposed economic bill of rights and guaranteed all Americans the right to jobs and health care and education. We could have such a thing. The reason we do not have such a thing is because our government is in the hands of the rich and powerful. But we could carry out a mobilization. We could enact and oversee a great awakening of the American people, bringing them into the political process to drive the money changers out of the temple, to drive Satan out of Washington, D.C., and to enact a government that would serve the people and work in the interests of the people. And it is our historical responsibility, and it is really an honor to be alive in the times in which we are living. I was listening to something the other day. It was interesting. Someone said that if we lived in an ideal communist world, we lived in a world with huge amounts of wealth. We lived in a world in which there was no inequality because so much abundance existed. If we lived in a world where there was no need for a government because everyone had enough, and people, people cared for each other. If we lived in a world of vast material abundance where there was no war, there was no scarcity, there was no inequality. That world would have one downside. And the downside of such a world would be that it would be very, very hard to make a difference. It would be very, very hard in an ideal communist world to go around making a difference. If you had within you what every human being has in their soul, a desire to believe you are doing the right thing, a desire to know that your actions are contributing to making the world a better place in the ideal communist future, it would be very, very hard, very, very difficult to find tasks that one could take on that could provide the fulfillment that all of us want to have when we're on our deathbeds. It would be very, very hard to live your life in a way where you could say, I made a difference because the world around you would be so perfect. The world around you would be so good. The world around you would be so flawless that it would be very, very difficult to live a life that helped make the world a better place. However, we don't live in an ideal communist world. We live in the United States of America in 2023 in a society where people are dying from opioids and people are committing suicide and our government is killing children with drones and sending weapons to Ukrainian Nazis and our bridges and highways are crumbling and our food banks are 
ravaged with desperate need of hungry people. And in the society that we live in now, if you choose to listen to the part of you that wants to do the right thing, if you choose to listen to that part of you, it is not hard to take action that can change the course of history, that can set us on the right track. Because there is evil and injustice all around us, begging, begging to be corrected. And because of that, those of us who aspire in our souls to be moral people, to be on the side of justice against injustice, those of us who have that drive within our hearts, those of us who live yearning to know that our life made a difference and mattered, we are almost living in the perfect time. This is the perfect time to be a revolutionary. This is the perfect time to be a social justice organizer. This is the perfect time to be one who seeks to live for a higher purpose, one who seeks to live for the sake of others. This is the ideal time. And we should be deeply thankful that we are alive in these dark times. We should be deeply thankful for that. Because the communists of previous generations never saw revolutions. The communists of the 1960s never saw, never saw the end of American imperialism. The communists of the 1930s, William Z. Foster and Gus Hall and those great organizers, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, they never saw the end of American imperialism. But it is us, those of us walking the earth in these dark times. It is us who have the real privilege of being alive in the moment where things can actually change. It is a privilege to live in these dark times because it is always darkest before dawn. And it is our generation that will live to see the sun come up. We will watch the sun rise. So we should be thankful that it's so difficult to organize in these times. We should be thankful. Thankful. We should be deeply thankful for living in the times that we're living in. Because these are the last days. The last days of American imperialism. The last days of a dying evil system that puts profits before people. The last days of a world where people are indifferent to the suffering of others. The last days of a world where people are atomized against each other and reduced to chaos and poverty and living out their lives as a mere financial calculation for the rich and powerful. We are deeply lucky to be living in the times that we are living in. Because our ability to do right and our ability to live a life that matters and our ability to fulfill our true purpose could only be possible in these times, in these last days. So as hard as it is, as hard as it is to live your life in these times, as hard as it is to spend your days watching the society around you decay. Be thankful. Because we were put here with a job to do. And we have the opportunity to get it done. But folks, I came here tonight because over the last few days, as we get ready for our events that are coming up this spring, I've been thinking about a lot of different things, processing a lot of different things. 
And I also became aware of the fact that it was time for me to dust off, dust off an old classic, right? Many of you are new. Many of you have only heard about me in the last year, maybe the last two years. So much has happened. So much has happened since then. But before I wrote the book, Bread Tube Serves Imperialism, and exposed that the so-called socialist internet was being run by pro-imperialist intelligence puppets, before the Center for Political Innovation had its meetups and gatherings and began forming, before our movement started organizing and building, before, before I met so many of you, during the 2020 election season, in September of 2020, I wrote this book, Kamala Harris and the Future of America. And it's funny because it was a big deal at the time that I wrote it. It ruffled a lot of feathers. Uh, the communist magazine uh, Morning Star in the United Kingdom ran a, a review of it. Um, you know, I know that Kamala Harris's staff knows about it. Um, I've been told that there are there's at least one copy of it in in her office as vice president. This book this book is in her office. I know for a fact that there is at least one copy of this in the vice president's office. This book shook. It shook the world, so to speak, in its own way. Um, I wrote the book because someone came to me with information about Kamala Harris's father and about Kamala Harris in general, and I thought, there's so much here that needs to be said. And the more that I studied Kamala Harris, the more I came to the conclusion that this book needed to be written because it was about so much more than one politician. And Kamala Harris is dangerous and evil, and we're going to get to that tonight. And the reason I've had to dust this book off is because they are trying to reboot her. They are trying yet again to psych us up for accepting a Kamala Harris presidency. She flopped as a presidential candidate. And they made her vice president. She flopped as vice president. Her staff kept quitting. She's fucked up and fuddled her job miserably. But now, in light of the fact that Joe Biden had these documents, these classified documents in Delaware. We're now seeing that they are once again trying to sell Kamala Harris to America. They are once again trying to push Kamala Harris on to us. They are trying for the, the, the hundredth time, practically, to get us to like Kamala Harris, to get us to accept that Kamala Harris may be our next president, that Joe Biden in two years, might be so old and tired, he won't run for president. And we got to accept Kamala, who's wildly unpopular, wildly unliked. We may have to accept her as our presidential candidate, you know, for the Democrats and, and as our next president. So recently, in response to the Yet another effort to reboot Kamala Harris. Reason Magazine and Reason TV ran a short, short piece just kind of going over what a disaster Kamala Harris has been, you know. And so I thought I would show that and then I would I would point to some of the things that that I got to in that book and how they're relevant in our time. But this is this is running for president in January 2019. Kamala Harris was met with glowing profiles, grassroots excitement and ready donors. And she is one of the top tier candidates. Yes, she was a prosecutor. Yes, she's a senator. But she's also someone who understands what people are going through across the country. I think there's a good chance that you are going to win the nomination. Almost immediately, her campaign was plagued by inconsistent policy positions and internal disarray. 
Meanwhile, Harris was haunted by her tough on crime past as a California prosecutor. You actually blocked evidence from being revealed that would have freed them until you were forced to do so. There is no excuse for that. And the people who suffered under your reign as prosecutor, oh, you owe them an apology. <laughs> This is going to sound immodest, but I'm obviously a top-tier candidate, and so I did expect that I would be on the stage and take night because there are a lot of people that are trying to make the stage for the next debate. Right. Yeah, it's do, the, for a lot of them, it's do or die. Well, yeah, and especially when people are at zero or one percent or whatever she might be at. Because of our own dismal polling numbers, Harris left the race 11 months later. But Biden picked her as his running mate anyway. And so she became the first female vice president, a black and Asian woman with a sleek image and a willingness to say things young progressives like to hear. Now, let's just stop it right there. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting, right? I have never had a stream die in midstream before like that. That's very interesting. But we will continue. We will continue. Oh, boy, we will continue. Anyway, I had just got part we had just gotten to the part um, where they talked about how she was she, Biden picked her as his vice president anyway. Um, here we go. Biden picked her as his running mate anyway. And so she became the first female vice president, a black and Asian woman with a sleek image and a willingness to say things young progressives like to hear. Now, I wanted to talk about that because in this book, that's one of the first things I talk about, which is that the way Kamala Harris was chosen was not the normal way that a vice presidential pick is selected. The way a vice presidential candidate is usually selected is that the, you know, the candidate for president announces on a certain day, he's going to name his, his pick. He names his pick and that's how it goes. That's not what happened. That is not what happened with Joe Biden. Joe Biden announced he would be picking a black woman as his running mate. And he would be doing it on a certain day. And then, in response to that, U.S. media started saying, well, geez, there's only so many black women, you know, in the Democratic Party that, um, you know, that, that could, could possibly be that. And they talked about Susan Rice, and they talked about Karen Bess, and they talked about different potential potential candidates. And Kamala Harris was out there. Her name was floated. And then the date that Joe Biden named came along. The date that Joe Biden named came along. And that date arrived. And uh, Joe Biden did not name a candidate. Five days went by. Joe Biden still did not name a candidate. The Democrat National Convention released its public schedule. This is very important. There was a list of speakers. And one of the speakers was listed as vice presidential nominee. And elsewhere on the schedule was Senator Kamala Harris. Meaning that Kamala Harris had not been chosen as the nominee. And then you'll recall that Kamala Harris unfollowed Joe Biden on Twitter. And everyone was just like, what the world is going on? She unfollowed? unfollowed Joe Biden on Twitter. That was really, really weird. And then a few hours later, finally, despite the Democrat National Convention schedule saying one thing, 
despite Kamala Harris having just unfollowed him on Twitter, finally Joe came out and said, Kamala Harris will be my running mate. But the weirdness did not stop there. It did not stop there. When Joe Biden was running for president, one issue that came up during the Democratic primary was the fact that Joe Biden likes to sniff women. Joe Biden likes to inappropriately touch women. Tara Reid came forward and described what he did to her. Kamala Harris was asked during the campaign whether or not she believed that Joe Biden was guilty of sexual assault. Kamala Harris said yes. She said yes. She said she believed the women who accused Joe Biden. And then after she was chosen as the Democrat nominee for vice president in her speech that she gave before the Democratic National Convention, she spoke about how she had been a prosecutor for many, many years. And she had prosecuted many rapists and many criminals and many many men who'd assaulted women. And she said, quote, I know a predator when I see one. And after she said that, there was an awkward silence. She didn't continue with the rest of her speech. She paused dramatically after saying that. I know a predator when I see one. And then she stopped her speech. And there was this moment of dead silence on the air. And then she continued with her speech. It was very, very, very interesting. And despite the fact that Kamala Harris bombed as a candidate, I mean, she just didn't have support in the polls, Kamala Harris ended up ended up being the vice president of the United States. It was very, very suspicious, but let's continue with the video. Black lives have not been taken seriously as being fully human. We have for generations now been defunding public schools, but yet militarizing police departments. That's right. She went on to bungle interviews, flip flop repeatedly, and fail to own any issue or commit to anything. Which is to say, Harris's vice presidency has looked a lot like her shambolic presidential campaign. Now, she's considered the Democratic frontrunner in waiting. Yet, no one can quite explain why. Talking about the significance of the passage of time, right? The significance of the passage of time. So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time. Harris arrives somewhere with a plane and a motorcade of the Secret Service agents, makes a few mostly bland statements, then tells whomever she's meeting with about how she's going to bring their stories back to Washington. Then she's quickly out of sight again, wrote Edward Isaac Dover in The Atlantic in May 2021. Two months prior, Biden had put Harris in charge of leading the administration's diplomatic efforts to address the root causes of migration from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, as the White House put it. It was a stopping a seas from rising kind of job, says Cato Institute immigration analyst David J. Beer, especially since Harris had no authority to actually change U.S. immigration policy. Still, a vice president could at least play a robust rhetorical role here, shifting the conversation around the issue or rallying Democrats behind an inspiring message. But rather than outline a coherent policy vision, Harris made a series of awkward decisions and comments that angered many Democrats and gave fodder to Republicans. We've been to the border. You haven't been to the border. I, and I haven't been to Europe. And I, I mean, I don't, I don't. Harris, whose mom was born in India and whose dad is from Jamaica, did eventually visit Guatemala, but then issued a disappointing statement for anyone hoping for a departure from Trump's immigration policies. I want to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek 
to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come. Do not come. If Harris runs for president, she can't point to her record as a prosecutor because it's mostly become an embarrassment. As San Francisco district attorney, she increased prosecutions and convictions for misdemeanor quality of life crimes and pushed for giving fewer people access to the city's drug court, which offers alternatives to incarceration. She opposed the prostitution decriminalization measure, helped federal officials raid immigrant businesses, head misconduct by a drug lab technician, and helped launch an anti-truancy initiative that would bring criminal charges against parents if their kids miss too much school. As California Attorney General, she fought against the court ruling that the state's death penalty was unconstitutional, fought to keep people in overcrowded prisons after a court ordered them released, defended the state's corrections department's denial of surgery for transgender inmates, and refused to back a measure requiring more scrutiny on police use of force cases. She also fought to shut down the sex worker-friendly ad platform Backpage while publicly ignoring sexual misconduct involving Oakland police and an underage girl. 1,974 people were sent to state prisons for possession of marijuana or hashish while Harris was California's top cop. Part of a politician's job is finding a way to work together with those in their coalition. Harris, meanwhile, has struggled to work comfortably with even her own staff, many of whom departed after brief stints on the job. A June report in Politico described Harris's office as tense and at times dour, marked by chaotic moments, low morale, and low trust. One person with direct knowledge of how Harris's office is run described it as an unhealthy and abusive environment where people are thrown under the bus from the very top. Should Biden run again? The question is dividing Democrats, read a September 2022 headline in Time about the oldest president in US history. But if not Biden, then who? A Los Angeles Times analysis of national opinion polls said that as of October 2022, 53% find Harris unfavorable, a drop of 14% since she took office. It's hard to avoid the sense that the Democrats have been so enamored with the package this particular candidate comes in that they're willing to overlook what lies beneath the surface. Harris's problems are her own, but in making her an avatar of its future, the party has made her problems their own too embracing box checking at the expense of political or administrative competence. Some say third time's a charm, but a more relevant adage here may be fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Eventually, Joe Biden will leave politics. When that happens, will Harris fool progressives a third time? So that was a good video. And that Reason Magazine, for whatever reason, I think because Reason Magazine is very opposed to the war on drugs, they're a libertarian outlet. Because they're opposed to the war on drugs, they have been on top of Kamala Harris and her record for a long time. Kamala Harris was a vicious prosecutor. Uh, she covered up for a drug lab that was giving false positive results. Um, you know, she tried to keep an innocent man on death row and tried to have an innocent man uh, executed. Uh, she, uh, what else did she do? I mean, she, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, she, she put over 2000 people in jail for smoking marijuana. And after that, then they asked her if she'd smoked marijuana. And she said, uh, -huh, uh -huh, you know, my, my family's from Jamaica. What do you think? Ha, ha, ha. And she laughed about it. Um, and Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris is a dangerous woman. She's dangerous in the sense that she has no moral or ethical bone in her body. She has no conscience. Um, that's why she's dangerous. But the reason I felt compelled to write this book back in 2020, three years ago, I wrote this book. It was kind of a big deal at the time. The reason I felt compelled to write that book was because I saw in Kamala Harris a problem that is very widespread in our society, very widespread in the so-called left, and is really, really at the heart of so much that's wrong in our modern world. When I talk about the atomization, when I talk about how people can't get along with each other, about how organizations are falling apart, and when I talk about the problems of wokeness and all of this, it really gets down to this. What they call leftism at this point has become nothing more than the 
science of victimhood. It's become victimology. That's what being a leftist has really come down to with Marxism and the struggle of the proletariat no longer being central with the belief in historical progress also being absent and no longer being part of the discourse. Uh, leftist politics at this point has been reduced to victimology. The science of victimhood. Some people are victimized by racism. Some people are victimized by sexism. Some people are victimized by homophobia. Some people are victimized by transphobia. Some people are victimized by poverty or victimized by police brutality. And leftism, without Marxism, without communism, is nothing more than the science and study of victimhood. Who is a victim? Why are they a victim? How have they been victimized? That's what leftism without Marxism, leftism without socialism and anti-imperialism and Marxism, that's what it has been reduced to, is victimology. The science and study of victimhood. Who is a victim? How are they a victim? Why are they a victim? That is basically what leftist politics has been reduced to. And that's Kamala Harris. The more you look into Kamala Harris's life, The more you dig into it, the more it becomes very, 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 very apparent that Kamala Harris views herself as a victim. And this is the information that made this book worth writing. Kamala Harris's father is named Donald Harris. Donald Harris is a Jamaican economist. He's a Marxist or Marxian. He's not a you know a communist activist, but he's he's draws heavily from Karl Marx's economic theories in order to provide economic advice. He was an advisor to the government, Michael Manley. Uh, Michael Manley was a social democratic leader in Jamaica. Uh, he taught economics at Stanford University. I'm writing the super chats down. He taught economics at Stanford University. And he met Kamala Harris's mother, who was a cancer researcher born in India at protests and they were protesting for civil rights, protesting against the Vietnam war at Berkeley. They started dating, they fell in love, they got married and Kamala and her sister, uh, were the product of that marriage and the marriage came to an end. Um, there was a divorce. Kamala Harris lies in her autobiography. In her autobiography, The Truths We Hold, she says the only thing her parents fought over when they divorced was the books. Well, that's not true. Kamala Harris's father has come forward and said they fought over the daughters. There was a huge custody battle for control of, of who got custody of Kamala Harris and her sister, Shmila. Would it be the mother or would it be the father? And from the time Kamala was quite young, the time I think she was about 10, if I remember correctly, Kamala Harris never saw her father. Her mother had full custody. And her father has a huge amount of resentment and anger about this. Her father very much feels like racism was the issue. He felt that the courts saw him as a black man. Uh, and there was this stereotype of black men as not being a good father, not being good fathers, etc. And that's why he was deprived of custody. Now, in my book, I point out that Kamala Harris hates her father. She hates her father. She hates her father. I mean, it's just a fact. 
Um, she eulogizes her mother. Her mother's a saint. Her mother's a hero. She loves her mother. But she rarely ever even mentions her father. She's estranged from her father. We don't know why this is. We really don't know why. Um, there's m multiple theories about this. The father has dropped us some hints in his essays and writings. Um, you know, but we don't really know. It's possible that the mother scapegoated the father, right? That there was some difficulty in the family struggling to pay the bills and the mother blamed the father for this. Um, you know, and that's, that's certainly possible that that often goes on when there's broken homes, et cetera. Um, it's possible that there is some abuse that went on, right? Um, you know, that, that is certainly possible as well. Um, we don't know what happened. And we also know that Ka Kamala Harris spent a number of her teen years living in Quebec in Canada. And she says almost nothing about that. Now, I've been approached by various people who've told me rumors about what might have happened to Kamala Harris while she was living in Quebec. I cannot confirm those rumors. And so I don't know. I've heard those rumors about what went on, but I cannot confirm that. So I chose not to include that in the book because it's just not relevant. And we can't conclude, we can't, we can't include things we don't know about. And it just doesn't, there, there's no confirmation of that. That's just, that's a couple random people came to me and they said, oh yeah, well, everyone knows blah, blah, blah happened when she was a teenager in Quebec. Well, I don't know that. Right. So I'm not going to publish something like that. Um, but regardless, she was a teenager in Quebec. Long story short, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris entered adulthood. vicious. I mean, I, I, I don't know how to put it in any other way. She entered adulthood with a huge desire for vengeance. She wants to harm people. She wants to hurt people. She wants people to pay. She wants to harm people. Like, no, no, Kamala Harris, she's not just selfish. She's not just self-serving. She's not a sociopath. She's not a sociopath. Kamala Harris is not a sociopath. Sociopaths are indifferent to others. Kamala Harris is not indifferent to others. She wants to harm people. She's a cruel person. She wants people to suffer. She wants people to die. She wants people to feel pain. She wants to hurt other people. And the reasons that she wants to hurt other people always involve invoking her own childhood. And it's bizarre. There's a clip that circulated of Kamala Harris just beaming, thrilled about how she locked up the parents of children who were truant from school. Kids skipped school, and so she put the parents in jail. Low-income children from low-income families. They were skipping school, so she locked their parents in jail. Now, does that help? No, right? I mean, if, if a child is not getting to school, that's obviously a problem. But if you put a low-income parent, the parent of a low-income family, you put them in jail, does that help anybody? No, it doesn't help the child. I mean, is that good for a child to have their parent in jail? But she beams about it. She's just joy overjoyed. And she says, you know, you know, it's just, oh, and, and, you know, we locked people in jail and, oh yeah, I started locking up the parents. She's, she's gleeful and just thrilled about it. And when she starts explaining why, why she locked these ch these parents up. She said, well, I wouldn't be anywhere if it wasn't for my education. So I think depriving a child of an education is tantamount to a crime. Do you hear that? I, I wouldn't be anywhere. I, I wouldn't be anywhere. It's about her. 
It's about her. Kamala Harris invokes her own childhood over and over and over again throughout the presidential campaign. One point when she was criticizing Joe Biden, she said, you know, she she talked about school segregation and desegregation and she shouted, that little girl was me. That little girl was me. She made T-shirts with a picture of her when she was 10 years old. That little girl was me. It's deranged. For whatever reason, we don't we don't know what happened. Okay, we know Kamala Harris hates her father, and we know that Kamala Harris entered adulthood with a desire for vengeance. She sees herself as a victim, and she entered adulthood with a desire for vengeance. And she does not care how many lives she destroys in order to get that vengeance. She locked up thousands and thousands of black men. She tried to have an innocent man put to death. She tried to block DNA evidence from being acquired in his case in the hopes that he would get the death penalty. DNA evidence later showed that that was not the case and he was taken off of death row. But Kamala Harris tried to kill an innocent man. She tried to have an innocent man put to death. She tried to prevent DNA evidence from being acquired because it might get in the way of killing an innocent man. You look over Kamala Harris's career, it is all about her strong desire to harm people. She is a criminal prosecutor. She went up, she was the district attorney of San Francisco, and then she became the California state attorney general. She wanted to harm people. She wanted to put people in jail. She wanted to kill people. And if you listen to the justification, it's because that little girl was me because she's a victim. She sees herself as a victim. And because she sees herself as a victim, whatever she wants to do is okay. Everyone else is just background noise. Everyone else, all the black men she locked in jail, all the, you know, the, the, the person she almost, you know, sent to, the, to their deaths wrongfully, those parents that she locked up and took away from their children, over truancy, which is a rather trivial, trivial matter. I mean, you know, I mean, kids need to be in school, but, you know, and then obviously didn't help those kids to have their parents locked in jail. None of those people matter. Kamala is desperate to have the world understand that she was wronged. She is desperate to have the world know that it's been unfair to her. And, I mean, she doesn't care how many people she has to harm in order to get this across. And it's extremely dangerous. It's extremely dangerous to think that you have somebody who could potentially have their finger on the nuclear button, who is so caught up in their own trauma, childhood pain, lust for vengeance, sense of victimhood, that they have no moral accountability. But she has no shame about locking up thousands of people for smoking marijuana when she did it herself. She has no shame about the fact that uh, that she, you know, she tried to kill an innocent man and put him on death row. She has no shame about locking up. I mean, you look at her life. She's she is a a vicious, sadistic person. She wants to harm people. She's not a sociopath. Sociopaths don't care. No, Kamala, Kamala is the opposite. She wants to do damage. She wants to kill. She wants to harm. She wants to inflict pain on the world. 
It's disturbing. It's extremely disturbing. But the more you look into Kamala Harris and her life, the more you see that this isn't just a problem with Kamala Harris. It's not only a problem with Kamala Harris. This is a widespread problem in our society, and it's a widespread problem with wokeness. Woke leftism, you know, le leftism without communism. It's this. Victimology. When you consider yourself to be a victim, it is a very, very dangerous thing to do. Because once you consider yourself to be a victim, you give yourself license to do whatever you want. People, people are hurt and people are victimized. Crimes are committed. People are in horrendous circumstances. People get the short end of the stick. People get mistreated. But when you give people permission, when you give victim people permission to see themselves as victims, that gives them the license to do horrendous things. You know, the French Revolution, the overthrow of feudalism, the aftermath of the French Revolution, they called the Reign of Terror. And that's where they were guillotining people. And that's how the reign of terror happened. The reign of terror included crowds and crowds of people gathering around the guillotine to watch person after person have their head cut off. How do you think those crowds and crowds of people in France piled into the square to watch executions, to watch the guillotine? What do you think motivated them? What do you think motivated the reign of terror? Victimhood, right? They'd been, they'd been victimized by the French aristocracy. The French aristocracy had mistreated them. And so it was justified for them to oversee the mass executions. You think of the bad things in the history of communism. You've got the reign of terror, you know, the, the, the great terror, Yezhov, Shina, and the Soviet Union, where people were turning in their neighbors. You think about the Cultural Revolution in China. The bad side of communism was when our movement cultivated a sense of victimhood. You know, during the Cultural Revolution in China, people that were the children of peasants got to take revenge on people that were the children of landlords. Uh, you know, people, uh, I mean, and, and whenever you do this, whenever you announce to society, if you are a victim, we, we recognize that you're a victim and you now have freedom to enact revenge on people who had it better than you or people that you perceive to have been, you know, been in a privileged position. When you do that, you're opening the floodgates. You're opening the floodgates to crimes against humanity. You're because it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. It's one thing to have courts and laws, but when you open up that can of worms and you say, "All right, you, this group of people in society, you're victims," and this group of people, they're the ones that victimized you. That's how you get genocide. There's injustices in this world that need to be corrected, but when you open the floodgates for vengeance. It's a nightmare. And it's a nightmare that, that doesn't end. It's hard to stop sometimes. And Kamala Harris, her entire existence, her entire career, her entire mindset, everything about her is just woke. She is the walking incarnation of woke. And then you ask me, how can that be, right? This is the queen of mass incarceration. She locked people up. Exactly. That's what woke is all about. That little girl was me. She's a victim. So she can do whatever she wants. That's woke. That's woke. 
We're not supposed to think about all the people she locked up. We're supposed to think about how that little girl was her. She got victimized. So therefore she gets to rage at the whole world and, and, and get vindication by terrorizing and destroying the lives of other people. That little girl was her. So you're not supposed to think about, you're not supposed to think about the actual consequences. Yes. The top prosecutor in California who destroyed the lives of thousands and thousands of people and tried to innocent, execute an innocent man. She's the essence of wokeness. That's woke. You're not supposed to think about the victims, the victims of the victim. You're only supposed to think about the original victim. And you're supposed to see it as empowering that she gets to destroy people's lives. You get, you're supposed to see it as empowering that she got to be this big prosecutor. Right? That's the essence of woke. And it's toxic. And it's destructive. And it enables people to do evil things. It is a... It is a mechanism for cultivating people to do demented and downright evil things. And if you look at the Biden wing, the Democratic Party wing of the regime change apparatus, you will see all kinds of people with a very similar life story to Kamala Harris. Great example. Another, another candidate for president was Amy Klobuchar. Amy Klobuchar. She was a candidate for president. She's a woman. She's a prosecutor. Okay. What does she have to do with Kamala Harris? A lot. Her father was an alcoholic. Beat up her mother a whole lot. The mother separated from the father. She was raised by the mother. She grew up hating the father. And then she became a prosecutor. And Amy Klobuchar is a prosecutor. She knew how to put black men in jail. She, she kind of turned it into an art or a science, putting black men in jail. She would have gang experts testify before juries. And these gang experts that would testify, you know, there's some black man is on trial for robbing a store or something like that. Well, she would have these professional flimflam men, these performance artists come and testify. They knew nothing about the case, but they would sit down and they would testify as expert witnesses, gang experts. And they would testify before the jury and these gang experts knew how to scare the crap out of the jurors, the white jurors mainly, and, and tell stories about gangs and torture and rape and violence. It has nothing to do with the guy who's on trial. And the guy who, I mean, this, this, and, and she would get these gang experts on the witness stand to just scare the hell out of these jurors. And these jurors would sit there and hear the testimony of the gang experts who had no knowledge of the case are just up there telling horror stories. And these jurors would then convict black men, not based on the evidence of the case, but based on the, the psychological manipulation and fear of a gang expert that was used as a witness, right? There's been art exposés about how this was done in Minnesota. This was done in Wisconsin. This was done in Michigan. These In the 90s, when there was this big rise in mass incarceration, they would get these gang experts before juries and they would they would convict black men. And the crazy thing is, this applies to Kamala Harris too. In the United States, nobody goes to trial. Barely any case goes to trial. Less than 1% of cases go to trial. Most cases are plea bargained. So very, very few cases even go to trial. So if that black man was sitting in that courtroom with a jury, there's a really good chance he was innocent. A very, very good chance he was innocent. Why would he take the risk of going to trial? Maybe it was his third strike. If they had a three strike law, you know, maybe he was exceptionally wealthy, but why would, why would that black man sitting there in the jury in, 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 on trial? Why would he take the risk of going to trial? The expense, the cost, all of that. 
But yet Amy Klobuchar would find the gang expert who would get up there before the jury and testify about how scary black gangs go around raping and murdering and have creepy initiations and and scare the crap out of the jurors. And these white juries would hear about about the horrors of gangs that had nothing to do with the guy who's on trial. And they would be so scared and they would they would convict him and send him to prison for the rest of his life. for Twenty five years, 30 years. That's what Amy Klobuchar did. No moral scruples about it. No, she brags about this. She doesn't question the morality of what she did. She doesn't sit there and go, geez, maybe I shouldn't have done this. And it's beyond me. They all go to, they go to all the Black Lives Matter rallies and they kneel for George Floyd. And it's like, but they were doing, they rose to power doing this, right? I, it's, it's beyond me. You know, they, this is how Kamala Harris, this is how Amy Klobuchar rose to power in the Democratic Party is through viciously destroying people's lives, making racist appeals to doing it, right? Um, but yet somehow, somehow, um, you know, they can, they can now be woke. Well, of course they can. Because woke, the woke mindset says that that's okay. Why? Because Amy Klobuchar's father beat her mom. That's why. Because Amy Klobuchar is a victim. So whatever she does is okay. And she has to make the whole world understand that she's a victim. And that makes it okay. That's what wokeness is about. It's not politics. It's vengefulness. It is, it is victimology. And that's what wokeism is. And that is why Kamala Harris is so dangerous. In another case, another wing of the Biden administration, Samantha Power. Do you know the name Samantha Power? Samantha Power. She was a journalist who promoted the U.S. intervention in Serbia and promoted the idea that that Serbia, that, that Milosevic was committing genocide. And she eventually, you know, got to be Obama's U.N. ambassador. She worked in the Obama White House. She was one of the big supporters of the U.S. intervention in Libya. You look at her life story. Born in Ireland. Her father was an alcoholic. Beat up her mother a whole bunch. When she was about 12 years old, her mother took her and moved to the United States. And a couple of years later, her, her father drank himself to death and died of alcohol poisoning. And if you look at Samantha Power's whole life, what does she do? She builds the case for war against countries that are led by men, right? Milosevic in Yugoslavia, Gaddafi in Libya, Saddam Hussein in Iraq. That's what she does. She makes propaganda against strong and powerful men. And she doesn't care about Libya, right? She's so mad. Gaddafi is this awful leader. He's this awful leader who, you know, who, who, you know, tortures or whatever. And so therefore, bombing the hell out of Libya, killing thousands of people and taking the most prosperous African country and reducing it to chaos and death and destruction is fine. Because you're not supposed to think about the people who actually suffer. You're supposed to think about how Gaddafi was this mean, powerful man and she got her revenge. She, the world understood that little girl was her. Samantha Power got her and she stood up. She took her revenge on Gaddafi. You're not supposed to think about the actual results. You're supposed to think about how glorious it is that she gets her revenge as a victim. Yugoslavia, again, you're not supposed to think about the impact of the bombing and all the people who died and, and everything that went on. You're supposed to think about the fact that she got her revenge. She got to take out this very powerful man. She got her revenge. That's the essence of this. This is what woke is about. Woke is a politics of vengeance. It is a politics of victimology. It is a politics that lacks any serious analysis. It is weaponized anger, weaponized resentment, and it is inherently destructive. And whether it's Kamala Harris, whether it's Amy Klobuchar, whether it's Samantha Power, there's a certain mindset and a certain biography, life story, certain set of traumatic experiences that one can have. That those who run the Democratic Party and those who run the regime change apparatus, the Hillary Clinton wing of the Democratic Party, the people who ran the Hillary Clinton State Department, they know 
they know how to push this button. And when they want to program somebody, and when they want to manipulate somebody to do their dirty work, they find somebody like this. They find somebody who's deeply and heavily traumatized. They find somebody who is just constantly living in traumatic childhood memories and constantly thinking of themselves as a victim. And they push their buttons and they push their buttons and they push their buttons. And that's Kamala Harris. And, and this is important. And I'm sharing this with you. Because I think it has a lot more to do. I'm concerned about the reboot of Kamala Harris, right? I mean, it scares me to think that she could be the president. I mean, I feel like, you know, we we dodged a bullet when her when Tulsi Gabbard, you know, exposed her with, you know, on the on the campaign stage. We dodged we dodged a bullet, you know, when Joe Biden, you know, he's he's luckily still alive. He hasn't had a heart attack or something to put her into power. And and she's so wildly unpopular. People don't like her. Kamala Harris gives a very gross vibe to people, but they are so determined to put Kamala Harris into the position of power that there is a, a there is millions and millions and millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars that has been spent just to keep trying to sell Kamala Harris to us. She's an unlikable person. She's she's condescending. She's self-centered. She's rude. She's narcissistic. She's a bully. Her own staff hates her and can't stand working with her. She, re she's, she's awful in so many ways, but they keep pushing her on us. They really want her. And the reason that they really want her is because they know exactly how to control her. They know exactly how to control her. They know exactly how to control her and how many buttons. And they would, she would drop the atomic bomb. She would nuke Russia. She would nuke China. She would have no problem launching World War III. They know exactly how to push buttons on her. In my book, I talk about it. And that's why I talk about it. But I talk about it in another way. Which is that, I mean, I, I'm talking about it here because it's it's important. We're getting ready for a big month of, not a, a big couple months. This is the Center for Political Innovation's back. We're going to have a big event. You know, I, I've talked about our conference March 25th and 26th in D.C. I, I talk about, um, in addition to that, I, I talk about our, uh, our very important participation on February 19th and the reception we're hosting afterwards. If you look at Kamala Harris, she's gotten stupider since taking office. And there's no way, there's no other way of putting it. Um, she sits there, the passage of time, the passage of time. And she's gotten stupider since taking office. Now, some people suspect that they may be giving her hallucinogen treatment. Um, and that's that's certainly possible, right? People have speculated that that she's been given hallucinogens as part of some like weird trauma PTSD treatment. That's really trendy now, right? Doctors are are really pushing, um, you know, and, and psychiatrists are really pushing people to take hallucinogens as part of their PTSD treatment and such. Um, but at the same time. I think she's just gotten stupider over the years. I think she's just gotten stupider over the years. And that's because it wears you down. This way of thinking, you know, it's, it's, it deteriorates you after a while. If you continue to think of yourself year after year after year as a victim, and if you continue to be motivated purely by your anger and resentment at the world, 
And if you live this way year after year after year, your ability to think critically starts to fade pretty quickly. You start to deteriorate. This isn't how human beings are meant to live. Right? You just keep year after year after year, decade after decade. Kamala is not a young woman. And her whole life, she has been governed by nothing but her desire for revenge, nothing but seeing herself as a victim. And it, it wears you down psychologically. I mean, you, you, you become less intelligent. It's not a healthy way of being. It's a, it's a form of psychological deterioration. You know, it's funny, there's a very famous novel called Moby Dick, a very, very popular novel. Um, Herman Melville wrote it. And if you read Moby Dick, um, the story is that this captain, this sea captain, you know, he was, he was, um, he was trying to kill this whale and he got injured and, and became, became crippled or disabled. He couldn't walk, you know, he had to walk with a cane because this, this trying to take down this very big whale. And so he spends his whole life in the mad pursuit of revenge after this whale. And, um, and the point is, it's the tragedy, right? That Captain Ahab or whatever that, you know, that he wasted his life, wasted his life, um, trying to track down this one whale that had disabled him. And he became so caught up in this rage and this desire for revenge and it consumed him and he was not a happy person. And that if you look at Kamala Harris, and if you look at people like this, Samantha Power, Amy Klobuchar, people like this, people who get caught up in this way of being, it is destructive. It, it tears you apart psychologically. You become stupider. You become weaker. You become less intelligent. It, it's not a healthy way of living. And eventually you have to stop living that way. Eventually you have to stop living that way or it just consumes you or else it eventually will destroy you. And I look at leftism now. I look at socialism and communism in America. I look at the young people that are interested in socialism and communism all over the internet. I'm talking as someone who spent eight years in one of the communist parties in the United States, who's been in communist and leftist circles my whole adult life. And that's what I see everywhere. That's what I see everywhere. I see that woke mindset, that rage that desire for vengeance, that thinking of oneself as a victim, that internalized resentment, I see it everywhere. But I see, I see that rage, that internalized resentment, that anger everywhere. That's what I see. And I know what it does to people. I've, I've had a lot of friends over the years who've been consumed by it. I've known a lot of people that were living this way. And you can't live this way. I mean, you can't live this way. It's destructive. And the thing that gives me hope is when I went to Russia, the World Festival of Youth and Students, met with communists from all over the world. When I went to Ecuador and I met with communists from all over the world at the World Festival of Youth and Students. When I've been to Venezuela, when I've been to Nicaragua, 
Real communism isn't like this. Real communism is not motivated by rage and destruction. That was there in the early years of the Soviet Union. That was there in the early years in Cuba and the early years of China. And those countries broke with that. In China now, they say the Cultural Revolution was a big mistake. And in Cuba, that period after the revolution, the immediate aftermath of the revolution, where they executed so many people, they had the public executions and all that, that's remembered as a dark time in Cuba's history. And the communist world has largely recognized that that toxicity, that rage, that hate, that lust for vengeance, that might be good in stirring everybody up, that might be good in creating instability, might be good in you know creating kind of a social explosion so you can overthrow the old regime. That stuff is toxic and dangerous. And that stuff is evil. And we now realize that while it used to be leftists that tapped into those feelings, right? The French Revolution and the revolutionary upsurges of, you know, the 1960s and all of that. It's now the imperialists. They are the ones who have decided that, you know, what they call libido, the drive for sex and violence libidinal release they are the ones who have hijacked it used to be communists and revolutionaries and leftists were the ones going around trying to push for libidinal release but now it's the ruling class the western imperialists they've discovered that they with their mass media and their social media and their movies they can they can manipulate and hijack the drive for libidinal release, the drive for sex and violence, the drive for a cathartic explosion, the drive for vengeance. They can use it for their own ends. And now, something that the left kind of, you know, was was pioneering, um, you know, uh, something that the left was pioneering has now passed into the hands of the imperialists. And the imperialists are now utilizing this drive for destruction and chaos and vengeance. They're now utilizing it as one of their primary weapons. Look at Ukraine. Look at the horrendous evil things that the Ukrainian forces do when they retake a region. They they go into these areas, they retake regions, and they, they tie the people to lamp poles, and they paint their faces with poisonous chemicals. And I mean, I can't show on these streams or they'll demonetize me. I can't show you what the Ukrainian forces do, but the summary executions and the torture that they're doing to people, look at what the Ukrainian forces are doing. Look about the ideology that the Azov Battalion preaches, right? The message is all of Ukraine's problems are somehow Russia's fault. Actually, Ukraine was much better off when it was part of the Soviet Union, so that doesn't even make any sense. But somehow, all of Ukraine's problems are all Russia's fault. Are you mad about Ukraine's problems? All right, let's murder and kill some Russians. Let's murder some children in Donbass. Let's burn the homes of of you know, of, of Russian speaking people. Let's light the house in Odessa, the trade union house on, on fire and trap the people in the building so They're burned alive. When they jump out of the building, let's take baseball bats and beat them to death. That's the Azov battalion. It's manipulated vengeance. You look at the Syrian revolution. Look at those forces, the head shopping Wahhabis. Look what they're about. It's the same thing. The imperialists have hijacked this, this libidinal rush, this drive for vengeance and made it their own. There's nothing revolutionary about it anymore. There's nothing revolutionary about it. 
In fact, the revolutionaries are the ones who do the opposite. The revolutionaries in China, the revolutionaries in Cuba and Venezuela, the revolutionaries in, in Donbass are the ones who say, we want stability. We want people to not be afraid anymore. We want people to have a decent life. We want people to be able to walk the streets without fear. We want people to be able to trust their neighbors and trust their family members. We want people to feel like they, part, they belong, like they're part of a community. In a weird way, the communists were now the conservatives because we don't accept the global revolution that Wall Street and Silicon Valley are pushing on the world. We don't accept their global desire for vengeance and chaos and head chopping and torture. And we don't accept it. We say, no, people before profits, people should come together. People should recognize their collective interests. We should have a government that cares for people. We should, we should have a society that puts the needs of the people first. We should think of, of the community. Like in a weird way, our, our goal hasn't changed. We want a society where the means of production are operated to serve the public, not the profits of a wealthy few. We want a society without homelessness and poverty and, and, and war you know, we want all the same things, but now we don't understand that to get it, you have to have libidinal release. You have to have chaos and death and destruction. And it's the imperialists in order to save their system that are unleashing chaos and death and destruction all over the world. They're the ones that are promoting Trotskyism and permanent revolution. They're the ones that are promoting instability and chaos. They're the ones that are taking countries that were stable and casting them into civil wars. They're the ones that are promoting chaos. And all we want is win-win cooperation. All we want is Russia and China and, and to be able to trade with the rest of the world. We want a government that provides jobs and healthcare and education for people. We're the ones who want stability. That's what we want. We're the rational ones. We want stability. And the imperialists are the ones promoting vengeance, promoting destruction, promoting rage, promoting chaos. That's what they want. And when we recognize this, well, that forces us to have to reorient our position. When we realize that there's nothing revolutionary about bloodlust, there's nothing revolutionary about violence, there's nothing revolutionary about chaos and instability, there's nothing revolutionary about victimology and rage. When we realize that what we're about is getting people to come together and see their common interests, when we realize that, that forces us to completely change our orientation. We're trying to rebuild relationships and communities, not destroy them. We're trying to teach people to forgive each other, not to be vengeful and hateful. We're trying to get people to understand that they have a common interest with other people. We're trying to get people to, to be intelligent and use their minds, not their emotions. And this is all very important. And this is why what we're doing with the city building tendency and the Center for Political Innovation is so important and unique. And this is, this is groundbreaking, pioneering understanding. We're breaking new barriers. We're doing something that needs to be done. We're, we're understanding how we can apply this in our time. That's what we're doing. It's really important what we're doing. No one else is doing it.
No one else is doing what we're doing. No one else is talking the way we're talking. No one else is cutting new ground the way we are. We're doing something very, very special. And we're going to keep doing it. So I just wanted to use Kamala Harris and my analysis of her as they attempt another reboot. I wanted to use that to get you all to, to understand this. So on that note, um, on that note, I guess we'll, we'll conclude the opening remarks. Uh, so names and locations, names and locations. I will call you all out as I see you. Names and locations, names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Names and locations. Who's with us? Who's with us? Names and locations. Who's with us? Who's with us tonight? So we got Timoshenko in St. Louis. We got Yonatan Mahari in London, the United Kingdom. Very, very good. We got JT24 in Mississippi. We got Mr. Wonderful from Qantas, David in Vietnam. We got Cedar Park, Texas, Philip Mack. We got Bendigo, Australia. We got Nico in San Diego. John McCarthy in Chicago. Ventos in New York City. Colin in Greensboro. Tristan in Maryland. Ty uh, Zachary Brunch in Richmond. Tyler in Missouri. We got Tristan in Maryland. Kieran from San Diego. Chad from Swiffle, Southwest Florida. Stephen Ann in Georgia. Marcos in Venezuela. Nate in Chicago. Heidi in Edinburgh. Carolyn and Dario from Brooklyn. We got Che Guevara in New Mexico. We got Quil Gilliam in Canada. Patch in Arizona. Mark Foster in Mission, Texas. We got Bob Troy in New York. Yada Yisrael. Uh, you know, we got, he's in Chicago. We got Jonathan in Los Angeles. Welcome, 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 everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We got Alex in Brazil. We got Che Lives. We got Gary Curtis in Indiana. We got Southampton, United Kingdom, Jennifer in Southern, Jennifer Southern by grace of God, Rainsville, Alabama. Karen Mendes is in Germany and up late. It is certainly late up there in Germany. Briggy in Pennsylvania, Devin in Connecticut, Gavin in Western Illinois. Um, this is an odd bird from Quebec. Micah in Las Vegas, Effingham, Illinois. Briggy in Pennsylvania. Maxim in Rochester, Devin in Connecticut, Gavin in Western Illinois. Welcome, everybody. So glad to have you all here with us. Make sure you hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Always a pleasure to have you on these streams. We're, we're doing great things. I only have a couple super chats here. So if anyone has anything else they want me to talk about, um, by all means, do so because send me a super chat because if not, it's going to be a short second half here. Um, but the first super chat we've got, um, it said, and who is the oppressor? And the person was asking that super chat in response to the comments that I was making in the stream about victimhood, etc. The point isn't to tell people that they're victims. The point isn't to get people mad and fired up. The point is to get people to understand the objective laws of history. The point is to get people to understand that capitalism is the problem and socialism is the solution. The point is to get people to understand that they have an economic interest and these wars are not being waged on their behalf. We're trying to make people smarter. We're not trying to make people stupider. We're not trying to hypnotize people and put them to sleep. That's the point. Um, and that, you know, that it seems like wokeness in a lot of ways is simply giving people permission to be angry, find teaching people to be resentful, getting people to point to ways that they feel like they've been unfairly treated in life uh, and stoking up that resentment for political purposes. And that in and of itself is not a revolutionary act. And it's actually quite dangerous. Um, so that's my my response to that first super chat. Now, this next one says, is it accurate to say that angry, woke victims are the new face of U.S. imperialism? I don't know if I would put it that way. The way I would put it is that fomenting rage and fomenting, fomenting a kind of woke, destructive, rage-filled impulse, that is the main way the imperialists are promoting uh, their system. 
during the Cold War, they mainly played on people's fears of communism. It's like communism is atheistic. Communism is not Christian. Communism is going to spread instability. You don't want that to come to your country. So align with the United States. We're going to stop evil communism from spreading to your homeland. Uh, now it's the opposite. Now it's, aren't you angry? I'm angry. You're angry. Here's a bunch of things to be angry about. Go out and tear things down. And that leads to the United States being in charge. Right. Some interesting super chats. But anyway, um, that seems to be the way they're promoting it. Right. It's they're selling. They're using they've hijacked leftist terminology. They've hijacked leftist terminology and leftist feelings, leftist sentiments, and they've made them vehicles uh, for imperialist politics. It's, it's always the revolution. It's the revolution in Libya, the revolution in Syria. It's the, you know, the, the, the Azov battalion, the, the Ukrainian freedom fighters. You know, it, it's they have hijacked leftist emotions and leftist aesthetics. Um, and there's always been a problem with leftist aesthetics. And that was the point of my opening stream, that even even when these these feelings were being used for good, for for fighting for justice, they still were problematic. You can't build a movement simply based on chaos and destruction. Um, that's my point. And that that it, it's dangerous and it's not intelligent. And that's the point that I spent the opening remarks making. And I've, I love to use Kamala Harris to make this point. And I wrote a whole book you know, about Kamala Harris. And I decided to dust it off and use it for this stream tonight because they're once again trying to reboot her uh, as a candidate. And, um, you know, that's that was the point that I was making. Um, so, you know, I hope that was helpful. I hope that was helpful to folks. Um, but yeah, I mean, they are using woke aesthetics, you know, angry victimology and resentment, you know, leftism without Marxism. That's what they're using to promote U.S. foreign policy right now. Next super chat question I got was, are you familiar with the mu music of Jesus or Jesus Jones? I am not. I am not. I don't know. I've never heard of that. I'm going to Google it. Jesus Jones or Jesus Jones, right? I assume it's Jesus, right? Um, yeah, I've never heard of that. It's a British alternative rock band formed in 1988. Never heard of it. That is the first time I've ever heard that name. I have never heard of Jesus Jones or Jesus Jones or whatever they are. I've never heard of them. Um, so that was that was that. Should branch COVIDians be forgiven? Well, look, a lot of people have been scared of COVID, right? I mean, it's very scary. I mean, a lot of people were very confused. They, you know, and you know, we're we're learning now, day after day after day, so much of what we were told about was was lies. And we're also learning day after day after day that a lot of things that people were persecuted for saying about COVID have turned out to be true. And that causes a lot of resentment and that resentment is justified. And we should use this to call out the media. But as far as average Americans who just bought into this, believed what their government was saying, you know, you know, acted out of fear, they, they didn't want to get infected or whatever, you know, I mean, that's not, you know, those people shouldn't be the target. But we should try to get them to listen to us. And that's the problem is that nowadays the way things work is if someone disagrees with you and you disagree with them, well, it's F you, F you. And, and then they go off on their thing. And even if they're proven completely wrong, they never do an about face. They never change uh, because they just surround themselves. This is the problem. The internet gives people the, the ability. People stew. They talk about stewing. If you're angry at somebody, you stew. Right. I, I'm guilty of this, too. Right? You just stew. You just stew in your anger. You just sit there and be angry. The Internet gives people when they're stewing. The opportunity, um, you know. It gives people the opportunity. No, no, you no. Uh, no, you can't do that. 
no, you can't just show me random clips of Putin talking and then no, if you want to send me the clip and I'll take a look at it, maybe include it in a future stream. Come on now. God. Anyway, um, you know, um, but you, people stew, right? They stew in their resentment, their anger, their frustration. They stew in it. And the internet gives people the ability to find other people with similar resentments and they can stew together and they can feed off of each other and their resentment and their anger can get more and more intense. The incel thing is a great example of that. And it's not woke. I mean, it's the opposite of woke. It's considered right wing. I don't think it's particularly right wing. It's just the incel thing is a great example of that. These young men who can't get girlfriends, they are angry at women. And so they find other young men who also can't get girlfriends and they're angry at women and they get together and they stew and they stew. And then pretty soon, you know, you've got, you've got like some full blown insanity. Um, you know, but there's many other examples of that, that I can think of. And I know people that are like this, you know, they just, they stew. Um, and, and social media and the internet has given the ability, people, the ability to stew and it's toxic. You got to stop stewing. You got to learn to forgive people. You got to learn to forgive people, you know, and a lot of this is me speaking to my own experience. And I mean, you all know me well enough. If you watch these streams, I talk about my own experience. I could have included my own experience in there, but I didn't want to. But maybe I will in the future. But, you know, coming out of that rage based politics, coming out of that destructive politics. OK. All right. Thanks. Uh, you know, coming out of that rage based politics, you know, is really important. And we have to put forward a constructive, optimistic socialism. That's what these streams are about. That's what CPI is about. We are building a community of solidarity, a community, a community of solidarity. And we're putting forward a socialist message that isn't about tearing things down. It's about building things up. We're the city building tendency. I wrote that book, City Builders and Vandals in Our Age. You know, We are city builders is our me message, right? It, we're trying to develop a socialist movement that can stay together and not rip itself apart. And we're trying to develop a socialist movement that will actually win and win over the broad masses of people. And that's not easy. It's very, very difficult in our time. I mean, everything is being done to incite people against each other. And we are trying, trying our hardest to do this. and. We are having success, honestly. You know, we had a today's meeting. You know, we have a Zoom meeting for CPI. We have one every Saturday. Today's meeting was beautiful. It was beautiful in a lot of ways. You know, we're putting together a team of volunteers who are going to be coming to DC to help with our events. And we're, you know, we got a vetting process, much more professional than things we've done in the past, much more well put together. And I mean, it was just a it was a great meeting. Honestly, I mean, I, I don't want to say too much about it because a lot of it's internal, right? I mean, we're in an organization. We're not public. I mean, I'm sure the government is monitoring everything we do, but it's not public. But it was a beautiful meeting that we had today. It was really beautiful. Um, and it made me realize how special what we're doing is, um, you know, um, how special what we do really is. We are trying to introduce something that is so unique, so unique into the political discourse. It's socialism, it's collectivism, it's, it's anti-imperialism, it's support for China, support for Russia, support for Venezuela and Cuba. But it's also, it's, it's about love and it's about community and it's about solidarity and it's patriotic and very friendly to Christianity and Islam and Judaism and religion. And uh, we're doing something really unique. What, what CPI is, I mean, we are giving expression to ideas that are largely there among the population. People are tired of this woke shit, but people are also tired of the danger of a new world war. People are also tired of being ground into poverty and economic injustice. The time is right for a new type of socialism to emerge, for the city building tendency, the optimistic, constructive socialism that I've seen around the world. It's time for that in America right now. It's time. It's time for that in America right now. Our day is coming. Our politics and our message is becoming um, it's becoming more and more relevant than ever before. And um, you know we're we're really building something beautiful right now, and i'm I'm really happy about it. All right, next super chat question. Um, how do you introduce the teachings of communism to people without scaring them off? Well, talk to people about poverty amid plenty. 
right? Talk to people about the coal miners riddle that I've told on here so many times. Talk to people about why are so many people homeless because there are too many houses? Why are people hungry because there's too much food? Talk to people about the common sense end of this before you start saying it's communism. Talk to people about the wars and what's really causing them and why the United States is carrying these wars out. Right? Again, provide the answers that only we can provide and don't put the communist label on it. Because honestly, I'm at the point where so many of the people in America who call themselves communists are so, so toxic, right? I mean, we're doing something different. I mean, yeah, I would say that what we're doing is more in line with what Marx and Lenin and, and Mao and Stalin and Deng Xiaoping were about. That's true. But at the same time, you know. Very good. So, same time, you know, you have to, you, we have to kind of make ourselves separate from the woke left. I mean, that's just the urgent necessity of the moment. We have to separate ourselves from the woke left. And so if we're separating ourselves from the woke left, you know, we may need to develop a different approach. So, you know, that doesn't mean we abandon communism. That doesn't mean we abandon the aesthetics of communism necessarily, but we, we got to just figure out different ways of doing things. All right. Um, okay, this person says they've run into a lot of Swedish syndicalists who believe in workplace sabotage. Do I have any advice on that? No, I don't. Um, the last thing I would ever do on my live streams was go into detail about how people can engage in criminal activities, right? Vandalizing your workplace, um, stealing from your boss, damaging the materials in your workplace is a crime. And so I am not, um, I'm not on this stream going to go into detail about how one can do illegal things. If I were to do that, um, that could have serious legal consequences. Um, so, you know, there you go. You know, um, I do know what you're referring to, though, with your your thing. You're, you know, that they called it the strike on the job. The Wobblies used to do that. The industrial workers of the world were notorious for workplace sabotage. I think, if I'm not mistaken, even the term sabotage is rooted in, it's like the, the wooden shoes, the sabos. They would use their wooden shoes to break the machines. And so that's where the term comes from, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe that's just some stupid fact I heard in a Star Trek movie. But, you know, yeah, I mean, that labor unions historically have engaged in wrecking there's a song by um uh what's his name uh joe hill the uh the old um the old uh wobbly labor union activist i think he has a song in fact i will maybe that's a little break we can have here um i'll put on joe hill's song about 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 workplace sabotage but i'm not giving any advice on how to do such a thing and i'm not even encouraging such a thing i'm just telling you that you know, um, Joe Hill, he had a song, Tara Ra Boom Die. Right. That was Joe Hill here. We'll put that on the old wooden shoe. Right. Um, all right, here we go. Yeah, here we go. This is someone performing Joe Hill's song about workplace sabotage, about worky workers damaging, damaging the means of production, damaging, uh, you know, damaging the supplies, um, you know, uh, so yeah, we'll put that on for you. We'll, we'll put that on. We'll put the Joe Hill song about, uh, about labor activism via sabotage. We'll play that here. I'm, I'm downloading it now, but yeah, we'll play that song for you. That'd be a good thing to put on this stream, I think. So yeah, glad you asked about it, but uh, no, I'm not going to give advice on that. And that's, again, you know, don't ask me advice on doing anything illegal. We don't advocate illegal things on these streams. We just don't. Um, you know, we, we, you know, again, the Center for Political Innovation Functions is a completely legal organization. We advocate a peaceful transition to socialism through the democratic process. Um, you know, so we just, you know, I mean, you know, there you go. 
but let me uh let me yeah we'll put this song on this is joe hill the syndicalist iww oh thank you gala i'm really glad you liked it i'm really really glad you liked it um you know we're gonna we're gonna put on tara raboom da uh by joe hill this is john mccutcheon performing uh, performing Tara Ra Boom Da, which is Joe Hill's song about um, sabotage, about workers on the job damaging property to try and compel their boss to treat them better. Want to give you all a little heads up of um, what some of the songs on Joe Hill's last will are based on. Joe was a master of taking popular songs of the day and fitting new words to fit new situations. This is one that he based, well, you'll see what it is. I had a job once threshing wheat, worked 16 hours both hands and feet, and when the moon was shining bright, they kept me working all the night. One moonlit night, I hate to tell, I accidentally slipped and fell. A pitchfork fell right in between the top wheels of that flesh. Tarara boom yay It made a sound that way The nuts and bolts and hay Went flying every way That greedy root said Well, a thousand shot to hell I could see well that night I needed it all right Yeah, there's many verses to that song, actually. There's there's many verses to that. But, you know, Joe Hill has this whole song, Tara Ra Boom Da, about workers damaging the equipment in order to get their boss to negotiate with them. So there you go. All righty. Um, 1999 apartment bombings in Russia, a lot of conspiracy. Um, I... I assume that that I if I remember correctly, that is that, you know, as Putin was running for president, the Chechen separatists who were backed by the United States and Saudi Arabia, they were Islamic extremists that were trying to break Chechnya away from Russia. Uh, they engaged in a series of like they took hostages and they did bombings and stuff like that. Um, right. And, you know that motivated people to vote for Putin because Putin was somebody who came out of the security services and was seen as a strong guy who would end the terrorism. Um, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, and of course, because it's Putin, right. It's funny. If you, if you question nine 11 in the United States, you're, you're silenced, right. They call you a conspiracy theorist. If you question, uh, you question the death of JFK. If you question anything, they, they try to silence you as a conspiracy theorist. But if it if something happens in Russia, it's almost you're, you're almost required to think it's a government conspiracy. All right. Um, you know, so, I mean, I don't find it hard to believe that Chechen separatists backed by the United States who kidnap and torture people and kill people. You know, I, I don't find it hard to believe that they would do such a thing. And I also don't find it hard to believe that people might vote for Putin because they wanted something to stop that. You know, I don't know the details of the events, but uh, the fact that you're allowed to question that, right? You're almost required to anything related to Russia. You're almost required to question it, um, but not not the United States. But anyway, there you go. All righty. Um, now, the next question is, do you think that the Harris presidency will be even more hawkish? Um, in this book, I talk about how there was a division within the Obama administration and that when Hillary Clinton was secretary of state, she was working against Obama, right? And that Obama was very angry with Hillary Clinton. He was constantly trying to restrain Hillary Clinton. I get into the details of what went on, why Obama fired Hillary Clinton and replaced her with John Kerry and how Hillary Clinton's backers all put their money behind Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris is in with a particular faction. When Hillary Clinton ran the state department during Obama's first term, the Hillary Clinton state department, was particularly vicious and they were regime change oriented. And those are the people that are backing Kamala Harris. Uh, they know how to manipulate her. And in this book, I go into great detail about this. So yes, I would argue that Kamala Harris and her administration would be far more hawkish. Yes, that is definitely the case. All righty. All righty. Um, the caviar left are now pushing Marion Williamson. Marion Williamson is interesting. She is very, very interesting. Um, Right. So she's this occult mystic. She writes like self-help books. She goes on Oprah's shows. She's into what is it like? You know, 
astrology and all kinds of weird occultist mystical stuff like that and um you know uh i understand she's friends with dennis kucinich and so she has some of a she has a left side to her right um she's got one foot in the the leftist camp right she wants health care for everybody and she puts out kind of a liberal thing but on foreign policy, she tends to echo the United States sometimes, but she's she's kind of a hippie, but she's kind of not. Um, yeah, I, and she promotes the book A Course in Miracles, which is like an, a, a mystical occult book that's really popular. And I don't know, she's just she's a um, she's an occultist who performs for rich people and um, she's going to utilize the power of love. And, you know, she's. It's hippie, hippie occult guru mysticism, and she, you know, she does psychic readings for Oprah, and she's, I don't know, she's a figure who's been around for a while, um, but, you know, politics in America has gotten so weird that someone like that would run for president. In the 90s, the idea of someone like that running for president would have just been absurd. Like, no one would have ever thought about it. Um, um, but... Um, there you go. Yeah. I mean, Marianne Williamson and, you know, some of what she says is decent. And, you know, when she talked about how the left is so mean, you know, that was an interesting clip, but I think she was getting at, if you watch, there's a clip of her saying the left is so mean. Um, let me see if I can find that because she's basically saying what I was saying on the stream tonight, you know, is that, you know, that, that the politics, uh, you know, the politics based on resentment and anger leads people to be, cruel to each other um you know and leads to destructiveness and that's what we're seeing all over twitter um so let me just let me see if i can find that clip um you know um uh, marion williamson says the left was so mean yeah well you can find the clip yeah but you know i mean she was getting at at that you know in a way and at, at getting at what i was pointing to in my stream tonight but i i hope that uh I hope that my stream tonight was useful uh, to all of you and we'll be back. We're going to be doing a lot more streams. I'm heading to DC this week um, towards the end of this week. My wife and I are heading to DC to get everything in order for our events that are happening this spring. Uh, so that's going to, or, you know, that's going to be awesome. Uh, two weeks, uh, two days in DC this week. Not sure if I'll stream from DC or not. I feel like I'm going to be meeting with so many different people. I may not have an opportunity to stream. Um, but I'll be in DC and then probably once the hotel is booked, we'll make our formal announcement about the CPI conference, March 25th and 26th. That'll be good. Um, yeah. So a lot of exciting things are happening. So thanks everybody. Um, a new upsurge in the struggle against U S imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since world war II, U S imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared. Revolution is the main trend. <coughs> Excuse me. While the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. And while the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared. Revolution is the main trend in the world today. Good night, everybody.